brothers and respected elders, we begin in the name of Allah. Thank Him, praise Him, glorify Him, seek His forgiveness and ask Him to send His infinite mercy upon His beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to forgive our sins and to guide us all to the right path so that we can live like Muslims, die like Muslims and rise like Muslims on the day of Qiyamah. My dear brothers, we as Muslims are required not only to believe in Allah and worship Him, but to obey Allah and His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all walks of life. Real obedience is to Allah. In al hukmu illa lillah. Real obedience is to Allah. But because we can't see Allah, Allah doesn't communicate or send revelation upon everybody. Allah chooses people whom we refer to as messengers and prophets. Allah sends revelation upon them and then they teach and preach to other people. Allah says, وَمَا رَسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Messengers and Rasuls are sent so that they will be obeyed and so that they would be followed. Rasulullah was sent by Allah so that we will follow him and we will obey him. So obedience to Rasulullah is in reality to obey Allah. And because the prophets are chosen by Allah, and especially Rasulullah was sent as a guide for the whole of mankind, uh, so obedience to Rasulullah is obedience to Allah. مَنْ يُطِعِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاءَ اللَّهِ Whosoever obeys the messenger is obeying Allah. Uh, so obedience to Rasulullah is in order to facilitate obedience to Allah. But we haven't seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam either. Uh, so we need someone else to tell us what Rasulullah did. Uh, Sahaba Ridwanullah Ali Majmain, they would see Rasulullah, they would, they would talk to him, and they would hear the Prophet's sermons, they would pray with him, they would walk with him, and they would talk with him. So for them it was no problem. But as the time progressed, when people hadn't seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or hadn't heard anything from him directly, then people needed to trust other people, or listen to them, or obey them, in order to obey Rasulullah, in order to obey Allah. You know, it's understandable, isn't it? So now we are 1400 years down the line in time of fitna and fasad, when yes, there are many books and many sources of knowledge, but real knowledge has become scarce. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied coming of such times, uh, when the Prophet said, this is a Sahih Hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمَ إِنْتِزَاعًا يَنْتَزِعُهُ مِنَ الْعِبَادِ وَلَكِنْ يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمَ بِقَبْضِ الْعُلَمَاءِ حَتَّى إِذَا لَمْ يَبْقَ عَالِمًا إِتَّخَذَ النَّاسُ رُؤُوسًا جُهَالًا فَسُئِلُوا فَأَفْتَوْ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ فَضَلُّوا وَأَضَلُّوا Allah doesn't remove knowledge by taking knowledge away as such literally. Allah deprives people of knowledge by taking ulama away. So much so that eventually there will not be a single alim left and people will take ignorant people, jahils to be their leaders and as such because these jahils don't know good from bad right from wrong themselves. Uh, so they themselves will be misled and will in turn mislead others. So my dear brothers, although there are so many sources of knowledge, CDs, internet and books, mashallah, so many millions literally of books have been written throughout the history of Islam by people on various different topics. And most of these grand works are available now and have been, publi have been published. Many books of classical scholars which had become, uh, which were not in, in circulation and had become extinct. And, but recently, alhamdulillah, many of these great works have been found and they have been published from, uh, people had uh, hand copies or, and they were found and they have been published and brought into public into public domain and people are able to buy them and access them uh, but people subhanallah people the likes of Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Bukhari or Imam Muslim Ibn Taymiyyah Imam Malik and others can we find any of them around uh, there is no one for the likes of them although all the sources of knowledge almost something has been written on almost every conceivable topic uh, but are there people around who understand these works and know about almost all these topics? Uh, 
So we are living in times of fitna and fasad when people don't understand the fundamental and basics of deen even, they pick up just a few books. And because they have their particular narrow-mindedness and they look at other people who might be following a different approach or a different opinion or a different interpretation and they look down upon them and accuse them of rejecting hadith or rejecting the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, which is not the case. There are so many uh, there are so many issues that people need to be aware of in order to to draw conclusions and ahkam and make istimbat from uh, from a narration or a saying of the Prophet ﷺ or a report on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ. This is why the Prophet himself ﷺ did not say, after me follow my hadith. The Prophet ﷺ made mention and said, follow my sunnah. Some people say, well, sunnah is the same as hadith. Well, the Prophet didn't say that either. And the Prophet didn't say hadith is same as sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ always made reference, I follow my sunnah. Alaykum bi sunnati. It is incumbent upon you to follow my sunnah. My sunnah was sunnah al khulafa ir rashidin al mahdiyin. And the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa. So Abu Bakr and Umar, Usman and Ali radiallahu anhum, they were on the right path. They were the rightly guided khulafa. Rasulullah gave assurance, guarantee of their practice and commanded his ummah to follow that. And in the Quran, Allah has also expressed his approval and pleasure, whatever was done or legislated or implemented by these khulafa. In Surah An-Nur, in the 18th news in Quran, Allah says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ Allah has promised with those amongst you who have iman and do good deeds that Allah will surely grant them succession, khilafat of earthly matters as He granted khilafat of earthly matters to the people before and Allah will establish their deen for them with which He is happy. So Allah has declared His approval in the Quran and His pleasure with whatever the Khulafa Rashidin did. Initially as Abu Bakr, then as Umar, then as Usman, and then as Ali. And from these four khulafas, especially as Umar, radiallahu anhu, Rasulullah in many a hadith has spoken volumes of his goodness. The Prophet in one hadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي مَا قَبْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأُمَمِ مُحَدَّثُونَ فَإِنْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ فِي أُمَّتِي فَإِنَّهُ عُمَرْ uh, verily, in the nations before you, there were people Allah used to talk to, and if there is any such person in my ummah, then it is Umar. Radiallahu anhu. Then the Prophet said, Wallahu ja'ala haqqa ala lisani Umar wa qalbihi. Allah has played haqq, Allah has placed haqq and truth on the tongue and heart of Umar. And we all know the famous hadith if there was to be another Prophet after me, it would have been Umar. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And in many narrations, it is also mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ after Fajr would sit down with his companions and ask if anybody had seen a dream. And if anybody had seen a dream, the Prophet would interpret that dream. If they hadn't, then the Prophet sometimes uh, would narrate his own dream. And the Prophet ﷺ on a number of occasions, he said, I saw a dream, I saw people wearing robes. Some up to their chest, some up to their uh, hips, thighs, knees, feet, ankles feet and then he said I saw Umar his robe was so long it was dragging behind him Sahaba said Ya Rasulullah what does that mean? The Prophet said knowledge deen Sahaba used to say 90% of knowledge is with Hazrat Umar so the Prophet wasallam has commanded his ummah to follow Hazrat Umar obey him to follow the rightly guided Khulafa the Quran says Allah is happy with him but many a people they try to justify their opposition to Hazrat Umar. Whatever Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu specially established, because in the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, there were other severe fitness, like Musaylima Kazab, and the fitness of those who were denying and, and, and refusing to pay zakat. The Romans were planning to invade Medina and the Muslims and wipe out Islam. Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was only around for two, almost two years two years and a few months. 
So he spent most of his time dealing with such issues. So by the time he left this world, uh, Islam was restored to its former proper glory. Then Allah gave Hazrat Umar almost 10 years or 11 years to implement and spread Islam and bring out the goodness and the best in Islam by implementing it as a total, as a total political system. And then Hazrat Usman and Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhuma subsequently followed up on those issues which were implemented and placed and put in place by Hazrat Umar. And one of those things, or a few of those things was the establishment of 20 rakat of Tarawih, uh, implementation of three divorces in one sitting to be three, uh, and the implementation and the widespread acknowledgement and to make people aware of the prohibition of muta and so on. And so that Umar radiallahu ta'ala, especially his period is a, such a golden period when the best was brought out of Islam. So when Ramadan comes every year, there is a problem. The problem of number of rakats of Taraweeh. People say, well, Rasulullah prayed eight. Well, did Nazat Umar know what is, what is sunnah? Some people say you can pray 20, but sunnah is eight. Well, Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, amongst all the companions, including Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha, when they established 20 rakat taraweeh, and it is undeniable, even Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah has acknowledged and stated clearly in his fatawa, in the time of Hazrat Umar, they established 20 rakat of taraweeh amongst the muhajireen and anasar. But people have the nerve to say, you can pray 20, but it is, it is sunnah to pray 8. So what they are saying is the Sahaba abandoned the sunnah of Rasulullah. And Rasulullah has given assurance of the practice of the Khulafa. Hazrat Umar is throughout his Khilafat. Once, once the Taraweeh prayer was established, continue to be 20 throughout Hazrat Usman's Khilafat, throughout Hazrat Ali's Khilafat, and since then, the Ummah has by far been praying 20 rakat of Taraweeh. So what did they say? What is, did they not know what is Sunnah? So what is the Sunnah? The Sahaba know best. And then subsequently the Fuqaha in my Mujtahideen. And then they compiled Deen and presented Deen into, in simple to follow instructions for the whole Ummah. And Subhanallah. My dear brothers, when people say, you know, hadith is the same as sunnah. Number one, it, it, that doesn't say in the Quran, hadith is the same as sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say it. And linguistically, hadith only means a statement. It can be a statement of regarding anything. Allah says in the Quran, Halataka hadith of Musa. What does that mean? Did the hadith of Musa, or statement of Musa teach you? Some people might say, well, he was a prophet as well. So the wordings of a prophet are hadith. Allah says in the Quran, Halataka hadith of Ibrahim. Did the hadith of the guests of Ibrahim reach you? They want prophets. And so hadith literally means a statement. It can be a statement of anything. So linguistically that's that's hadith. But obviously as Muslims, we have come to accept hadith to imply a statement regarding what the Prophet ﷺ might have said or what he might have did, or he might have done. and But it's still a statement. A statement can be right, it can be wrong. This is what a hadith as sahih, daif, modu, fabricated, weak, and there are, there's an all different classification of hadith. But sunnah is sunnah. Have you ever heard anybody say, ah, this is sahih sunnah? Ah, this is weak sunnah. Huh? Does anybody talk about sahih or weak sunnah? Sunnah is sunnah. When something is sunnah, it means it is proven, accepted, authentic. But hadith can be sahih, can be weak, and can be fabricated, because it's only a statement. And whether a hadith is sahih or da'if, weak or authentic, it's a question of opinion. There isn't a single hadith anywhere in any book regarding which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in advance, Hadha hadith sahih. 
How can the Prophet ﷺ have said it when these when the hadiths were compiled, classified many generations later? So whether a hadith is sahih and daif in itself is a question of opinion. When some ulama, when some muhaddisun, when some muhaddisun, when they trace a narration back to the Prophet ﷺ, if they find that it's been traced back to the Prophet ﷺ with reliable, trustworthy narrators, then such a chain is referred to as Sahih. And if they find there is any link in that narration, where a person says, I heard from so and so, who heard from so and so, who heard from so and so, from a Sahabi, who heard from Rasulullah ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ said this. Or if somebody says, I heard from so and so, who heard from so and so, who heard from so and so Sahabi, that the Prophet ﷺ did this. So if every one of those narrators or the links in that chain was considered to be trustworthy and people of sound knowledge and understanding according to the man who has reported it right at the end or compiled it, then he classified that as sahih and authentic, reliable. But if anybody found that any of those links or narrators in that chain were unreliable, not trustworthy, or their understanding and knowledge or absorption of what they would hear wasn't up to scratch, then they considered that to be a weak link. And then they labeled that narration as weak. But we find in society, and this is also apparent in, uh, amongst muhaddisun as well, that everybody doesn't trust everybody. Although there are many a people, they are well trusted by everybody, but some people might be trusted totally by someone, and another person doesn't trust them at all. Like we have friends and people that we know, some people, you might not trust them with a penny, but somebody else might trust them with their life even. Yes, so same thing applies to narrations of hadith. Many muhaddisun, they regard a particular narrator to be totally reliable and dependable, while somebody else says, no, I don't accept him, I don't accept his narrations, he's nothing. So this is why in, in books of hadith, there, there are these complicated discussions, whereby one muhaddis says, this man is reliable, and, the other, and another muhaddis says, no, he's not dependable, and we can't trust him, we shouldn't rely, accept anything he says. So those who regard a particular narrator to be trustworthy will label his narration as authentic and reliable, while another will consider it to be nothing and will not accept it, will, will accept the narration, okay, it's there, but will, will regard it a, a, to be weak or da'if. So whether a narration is sahih or da'if in itself is not conclusive, is not qata'i, is not absolute, it's again a question of opinion, unless Unless an issue has been reported by so many different chains that you can't de deny the fact that all these people could be speaking the truth. Such an issue is known as mutawatir and has such, you know, there are very few ahadiths which are mutawatir. Uh, but majority of the hadiths have been reported by a few chains which doesn't reach that level. So whether a hadith is sahih or daif in itself is a debatable issue. And another thing is, when people book, pick up books of hadith, as many a people do nowadays, it's, it's regarded as a matter of great thing for people now to study Bukhari, pick up Sahih Bukhari on their own and try and study it. And then people derive their own conclusions, make their own istimbat, make their own ijtihad based on hadith. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that. And the Prophet wasallam, subhanAllah, even though Sahih Bukhari is generally regarded as Asahul Kutubi Ba'da Kitabillah, the most authentic book after the book of Allah. But Imam Bukhari rahimahullah never ever claimed that he has compiled and brought all the Sahih narrations in his book. No one has ever made that claim. Just as there are narrations in Bukhari, Sahih, there are Sahih narrations in other books as well. Because Islam was sent down over a period of 23 years. So what happened Sahaba, whatever period of time, 
they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they saw the Prophet ﷺ doing whatever on a particular occasion. They reported it and that report continued until the Muhaddisun acquired it and then compiled it in some of their books. So if a person is picking up a book of hadith and trying to draw his own conclusion, then many a times he doesn't know what else is stated regarding the same issue in another book elsewhere. And they pick up a book of hadith and they say, well the Prophet ﷺ seems to have done this, but you guys, you follow your imams. And those imams apparently seem to contradict this hadith. So who are you going to follow? Your imam or are you going to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If somebody asks you the same question, what would you feel obliged to answer? Who are you going to follow? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa or your imam? You see, this is where people get caught out. And the way this is a very crafty, uh, worded question. And most people don't realize, in fact, that this is an illogical and a really a silly question. It's like asking someone, brother, where do you live? London or England? <laughs> huh? Is that a good valid question? Sensible question? Because London is in England. But brother, where do you live? Mogadishu or Somalia? <laughs> Where do you live? Islamabad or Pakistan? No, it's a wrong question. You want to ask brother, where do you live? London or England? No, London or Birmingham? Where do you live? England or Scotland? England or Pakistan? That's a valid question. Uh, similarly, who are you going to follow? Imam Abu Hanif or Imam Shafi or Rasulullah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know the guy's lost the plot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. When you, want, when you compare one imam, you compare him to another imam. You don't compare an imam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if somebody said, brother, who do you follow? When we say follow, it means in controversial, ambiguous or undefined issues, which, which in, in Islamic terminology are, are referred to as faroi masail. In these faroi mis- ma- ma- masail, controversial, ambiguous or undefined issues, do you accept the opinion of Imam Abu Hanif or Imam Shafi? A valid question. Whose Sharia do you follow? Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or Isa alayhi wa sallam? It's a valid question. How about to say, who are you going to follow? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or Imam Abu Hanifa? This is an illogical question. It's not a, it's not a valid question. And the person who poses this question, he is a jahil himself, he doesn't know what he is saying. It's like asking someone, brother where do you live, London or England? It's an illogical question. You know straight away the guys lost the plot. And many a times when people pick up a book of hadith and they see some people who follow a particular imam, and there is no problem in following an imam. In fact, it has become a necessity to follow an imam. And when, when people, what they do, they present a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and they expect other people to take that on board. And for general people, in fact, if a person doesn't even know hadith and he follows his imam, not just the likes of Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, if he follows a respectable imam, imam of modern times, Imam of his masjid or a local scholar, even that is usually sufficient. And I'll give you an example. Suppose an ordinary person or anyone goes to a scholar of modern times and he says to him, Brother Sheikh, can you please teach me how to pray? And the Sheikh says to him, Brother, when you are ready to pray, Obviously you have to make wudu and ablution. So assuming he knows how to make wudu. So he says, brother, when you want to go to pray, the place where you want to come and pray, come and stand there facing the qibla. You know, point your feet, for example, towards the qibla and raise your hands up to your ears or up to your shoulders and say Allahu Akbar and then raise your hand, place your hands right on top of the left either below the navel or above the navel, wherever, there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars. 
and then recite Subhanakallahumma or inni wajahtu wajhiya lilladhi or any of the du'as which has been uh, prescribed and then recite Fatiha, then a surah and then say Allahu Akbar, go into ruku, make ruku recite three times Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim then rise from ruku saying Sami Allahu liman hamida then say Rabbana lakal hamd then go into sajda and then show him how to perform sajda and what to recite in sajda then get up from sajda sit down shows shows him how to sit in between sajda then perform another sajda and then stand rise saying Allahu Akbar that's one rakat done and likewise he shows him how to perform and complete the second rakat and he teaches him how to complete two rakats or three rakats or four rakat prayer as might be the case and while teaching him he doesn't quote a single verse of Quran doesn't make reference to a single hadith of the Prophet wasallam. doesn't quote any hadith from Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nisaya, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah or wherever doesn't make reference to single hadith he just teaches this person what he has learned and how to perform the prayer like this by simple to follow instructions what do you think do you think his prayer will be valid this person who's learned to pray without being t- told a single verse of quran or a single hadith do you think his prayer will be valid or not yes. sheikh what do you think huh his prayer will be valid He's not been told a single hadith. He's not been told a single verse of Quran. He's been told what to do. Just raise your hands, recite this, do ruku like this, get up, make sajda, recite this. He doesn't know a single verse of Quran. Not a single hadith from anywhere. Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nisai, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, wherever. You all agree. And everybody will agree that his prayer will be valid if it's performed properly like that. Yes? So what does that prove? Ordinary person is not obliged to know hadith. If you were obliged, that means you would have all said, no, if you don't know the hadith and proof, your prayer is not valid. So who has taught us how to do this? Raise your hands to wherever, tie your hands, recite what? Who has done this? Who has taught us? Who were the first people to come out with these simple to follow instructions? The Fuqaha, the Imam Mujtahideen, and amongst them the first was Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Then was Imam Malik, then was Imam Shafi, then Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah. And the Ummah for us, uh, ever since after them has been following this practice. When you, were, when you all learned to pray your Salat, when you were children, did you at the age of five, six or seven, open Sahih Bukhari <laughs> and, and start learning, you know, reading, learning those hadiths? No. You, you learn to pray, most people, most Muslims rather learn to pray from their parents or from the local masjid wherever they go. And without knowing the evidences. I am not saying for one moment that Muslims should not learn the evidence. No, the evidence is there can be learnt, should be learnt. But it's not an obligation upon you to learn. Uh, if it was an obligation, then all of you would have said, if you don't know the hadith to back up your action, then your prayer is invalid. But you didn't say that. No Muslim, no Mufti will say that. And they can't say that. So it proves the vast majority of the people only need Simple to follow instructions. Like when you go to the doctor. What does the doctor do? He analyzes, he assesses you, examines you, and then what he sees fit, he just prescribes the appropriate medicine in his opinion. Have you ever questioned his authority? Doctor, I need the evidence please. You know, who invented this formula? And what makes you think that for my specific situation I need this particular dose and in that quantity and what makes you think that this particular company who's manufactured this particular medicine is the right one and if anybody does what will the doctor say to him 
So, so similarly, in deen, the issue is the same. Our deen is the deen of fitrah. By far the majority of people, that is all they, they need to be told what to do. Obviously, by reliable scholars and people you trust, people who've been trusted, and who better than someone who has been trusted for centuries? These grand fuqaha, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahumullah, have been trusted and followed by the greatest of scholars this ummah has ever known. So if you follow these one of these Imams, for example, in such controversial, ambiguous, and undefined issues, you are following 1200 years of Islamic scholarship. And on the footsteps of 1200 years of the Ummah being on the right path. And it is only recently now, mashallah, with the spread of the printing presses and so on, that many of these books have become readily available. Otherwise, in m most parts of the Islamic world, these books weren't even readily available. So what are we saying? Thus, for 12, 13 centuries, the whole Ummah was deprived of guidance. Uh, so many a times when, when brothers, for example, pick up books of hadith and they find, for example, in Bukhari, it says Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for example, used to raise his hands before going into ruku and after rising from ruku. I accept the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has done this and did used to do it. I am not saying it is wrong for one moment. I accept it is. But many people, what they say, brother, look in Bukhari, it says this. And you people, especially the Hanafis, you don't do this. So who are you going to follow? Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah, or, or, or Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So many of the brothers, they get cornered in this issue. While, while this particular brother, he, he himself probably doesn't know, or if he knows, then he's deliberately hiding the fact that in another narration, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, as reported in Sahih narration, and Shaykh Albani rahimahullah has also declared this to be Sahih, as reported in Nisai, Tirmzi, and Abu Dawud, and in many other books of hadith as well, Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu would say, Ala usalli bikum salata rasulillah faqama fasalla, falam yarfa'u yadayhi illa fi awwala marra. He would say, shall I show you the prayer of the Prophet, and stand and rise and raise his hands only in the beginning and never again. And the hadith in Bukhari is reported by Abdullah ibn Umar and Malik ibn Hawairith. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was praying with Rasulullah before Abdullah ibn Umar was even born. So the, the Sahabi of Rasulullah who was with him throughout his life, he's saying one thing, Imam Bukhari hasn't reported it, but somebody else has. But they say, brother, but it's in Bukhari. But in Sahih Bukhari it also says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to stand and urinate. So how many of you stand and urinate? Can anybody say it is sunnah to urinate while standing? And then especially brothers they say, well whatever Rasulullah did, it was valid for men and women. So okay, men might be able to stand and urinate, but how are you going to teach your wife or daughter to stand and urinate? Well, it's in Bukhari. So it shows, hadith is hadith. Uh, but people need the simple instructions which will be derived by fuqaha. They will establish uh, whether a sunnat, every hadith is sunnat, or it's just a hadith, or what's the conclusion from the hadith? Is it something which is specific to a particular occasion? Many a times the Prophet ﷺ did something, and there was a reason it was just for that specific occasion. Many things the Prophet ﷺ did, and it was in an earlier period, and then the Prophet stopped doing that, and then started doing something else. And ordinary people, and in ordinary narrations, it won't say that and make that clear. So it is the fuqaha who will be able to then determine, and, and look at all the hadiths overall, and come up, with simple to follow instructions which are applicable generally and to people in, in, uh, in general conditions. Many a times when people they say 
they see such contradictions in hadith and the practice of people. They, are, they get very excited and say, look, your Imam says this and the Prophet ﷺ has done this. So, you're, so Imam Abu Hanifa, and I say Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah because he had more than his fair share of critics. And Ibn Abdul Bar rahimahullah, who was a Maliki scholar of the 4th century, he has stated, anybody who criticizes Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, either doesn't know how, 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 how learned he was, or is purely jealous of him. And like all great people, Imam Saab had more than his fair share of critics. And just because someone has criticized someone, it doesn't mean that the criticism is right. That criticism might be out of ignorance. Criticism might be out of jealousy. Well, whatever reason, Allah knows best. And people say, well, Imam Abu Hanifa stated this, when the Sahih Hadith states this, one very famous person, he go, he, he's, his lot of his clips are on, are on YouTube. He runs a satellite channel as well. And he says, in the time of Imam Abu Hanifa, all the hadiths had not even been compiled. So what he's trying to imply is uh, that because they were not compiled, so perhaps or probably Imam Saab didn't know those hadiths. So he could not come to the right conclusion. And that is an absolutely, what can I say, is a baseless accusation. And it doesn't fit any scholar to make such a claim. Because if this claim, that because hadiths had not been compiled by the time of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, they were compiled after the time of Imam Bukhari, who was, who was then followed by people like Imam Muslim, Imam Tirmizi, Nisai Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah and others. So in the third century of Islam, all the hadiths were compiled. So this would mean that whatever Sahaba did as well wasn't valid because hadith wasn't even begun to be compiled in their times. You understand? Because many of the Sahaba hadn't seen the Prophet ﷺ for very long periods, they might have seen the Prophet and lived with him you know, for a short while and observed him on, on, on a few occasions because only a few Sahaba or a few hundred or thousand were with Rasulullah in Medina throughout. Other Sahaba, majority became a Muslim after the conquest of Mecca, 100,000 plus. And after the conquest of Mecca, Hijrat wasn't obligatory anyway. So many of them didn't even come to Medina to spend so much time with the Prophet ﷺ. So they hadn't heard much from the Prophet directly. And so they didn't get a chance to learn many ahadiths. So what this implies, what this would imply then, that what those Sahaba did as well, Na'uzubillah, was in ignorance and wasn't valid either. Because hadith had not been begun to be compiled. You understand? Allahu Akbar. But I'll give you a few examples of how even Sahaba, Ridwanullah Majma'een, and many of the learned Muhaddisun, uh, in spite of knowing a hadith, they will then do something which appear to contradict what the hadith is saying. People are very quick to point fingers at Imam Abu Hanifa Ramaullah, or Imam Shafi, or Imam, or these Fuqaha, whom Allah had blessed, and they. In, in, in light of the knowledge Allah blessed them with, which was far greater than anybody who came after them, they, they drew uh, simple step-by-step -step instructions and left the ummah with ease to follow those instructions. And, but, in the incident of Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet ﷺ came to perform Umrah, and he was stopped by the Meccans from entering Makkah, then eventually a peace treaty was agreed. And while the treaty was being agreed and written and signed, the Prophet ﷺ was dictating the peace terms. And Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu, he was writing on behalf of the Prophet. So when the Prophet started dictating the, the, the terms of the, the treaty, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu was writing that this is a treaty between Muhammad Rasulullah and the people of Makkah. The Makkans objected, well that's the whole uh, the point of contention. We don't accept you to be Rasulullah. If we had accepted you to be Rasulullah, we wouldn't be doing this. So they said, why? They, they said, wipe out Rasulullah. The, the, the word Rasulullah, 
wipe it out. The Prophet said to Hazrat Ali, Ali, rub it out. The Prophet said it directly to Hazrat Ali. Imam Abu Hanifa or any of the other Imams, if they draw a conclusion, they haven't heard. Or the Prophet say things directly to them. Whatever somebody else might be presenting again as evidence against the Imam, he didn't hear it directly either. But here, in this incident, Rasulullah said directly to Hazrat Ali, Ali rub it out. And then Hazrat Ali's response was as narrated in many books of hadith, including Sahih Muslim, Hazrat Ali said, Wallahi la amhaha. Rasulullah said, rub it out. Hazrat Ali said, I swear by Allah, I will not rub it out. Is that not a direct, direct denial of what Rasulullah was saying? So those who are quick to point fingers at Imam Abu Hanifa, what will their fingers be pointing at? How many fingers will they be pointing at as Ali? The Prophet ﷺ said to Ali directly, Ali rub it out. And as Ali didn't say, Ya Rasulullah, how can I? <coughs> Imam Muslim rahimahullah has, has quoted in his Sahih, Hazrat Ali's answer was, Wallahi la amhaha. I swear by Allah, I will not rub it out. So how many dare will any Muslim in his right frame of mind, senses and iman dare say that Ali was nauzubillah, nauzubillah wrong to say that? What will you say? Hazrat Ali, his strength of iman did not enable him to rub out Rasulullah. So he, when he said, Ya I swear by Allah I will not rub it out. Was that in denial of a command of Rasulullah or in love of Rasulullah? Love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that I cannot hear Rasulullah. But the apparent, when you look at it, what was actually said, isn't that a direct denial of what Rasulullah was saying? There was an incident when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sent an army to Banu Quraiza while the Khaybar expedition event was taking place. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sent a group of Sahaba to Banu Quraiza. According to some narration, the Prophet ﷺ said to them, None of you should pray Zuhr Salat except in Banu Khurayza. In another narration it says, and the Prophet said that none of you should, should pray Asr Salat except in Banu Khurayza. So it was either Zuhr or Asr. What the Prophet ﷺ had meant was before the prayer time ends, reach there so that you can say your prayer there. What happened? The Sahabas become, became delayed. And then... When they became delayed, they became divided into two groups. One group said, we will not pray except in Banu Quraidah, even if the time of Salat lapses, because that's what the Prophet said. And then the other group said, no, what the Prophet really meant was we should leave early in order to get there in time and say our prayer there. But we already become late, we need to pray on time, so we pray and then we proceed. So, half, so some of them prayed, some of them didn't pray. And then, when the matter was reported to the Prophet ﷺ, he says in hadith, فَلَمْ يُعَنِّفْ وَاحِدًا He did not admonish any of them. So when the Prophet ﷺ accepted the practice of the Sahaba, when they even though appeared to be denying and doing the opposite of what Rasulullah ﷺ said, because that's the way they understood it. Many a times, the Prophet ﷺ said something and it wasn't an obligation but rather a recommendation. It's a famous hadith, it's been reported in many books of hadith uh, with, with the effect that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged his followers and his ummah to wear white clothes. Albis thiyab al abiyad Wear white clothes. فَإِنَّهُ أَطْهَرُ وَأَطْيَبُ وَكَفِّنُوا فِيهَا مَوْتَاكُمْ Because wearing white clothing is good. It's clean, it's better. And when, you're, uh, when you people die, then, then coffin your dead in white clothing. Enshroud them in white. So the Prophet ﷺ gave order, command, Amr. Albisu, wear white clothing. So how many of you are wearing white clothing here? So does that mean you are disobeying Rasulullah? How many of you, how many people would think just because he is not wearing white clothing, he is disobeying Rasulullah? Although the Prophet 
And the wording is albisu, wear white clothing. Wear white. So, so what do people say? That this is recommended practice, desirable practice. But the Prophet didn't say it's desirable. The Prophet said wear it. But the ulama they say, nobody who might be wearing black or brown or green or what grey or whatever. Brother, when the Prophet said wear white, why are you wearing grey or brown or blue or whatever? Don't you have shame? You know, don't you have any fear of Allah? Rasulullah is saying white and you are bad. You know, you are buying, wearing, and all the time, you, you know, you wear colored clothing. Rasulullah didn't say wear colored clothing. So, from here we can deduce that this is a recommended practice. If you, if you wear it, it's good, mashallah. But if you don't, you are not wrong. There, there's an incident where a sahabiya, she came to the Prophet sallallahu and one Sahabi and Sahabi, husband and wife had, a, had an argument and the husband ended, ended up uh, divorcing his wife or, or she came and sought separation from the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, the man having given her talaq or having separation caused between husband and wife, the man loved his wife dearly and he would miss her. So he came to the Prophet ﷺ to ask the Prophet, if he can ask his wife to reconcile with him. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, you know, go back to your husband. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, is that an order or is that a recommendation? If you order, then I'll accept it. But if you are suggesting or recommending, then I don't want to. The Prophet said, it's a recommendation. Well, she said, Ya Rasulullah, with all due respect, I don't want to go back to him. So would, how many would dare place a fatwa on this sahabiya uh, that she did against what the Prophet Sallallahu desired. There's a hadith in Bukhari and many other books as well. The Prophet Sallallahu has stated, لا يتمنى أحدكم الموت None of you should wish and pray for death. And Imam Bukhari has reported in his Sahih as well uh, that it's better for a person to live long if he is pious then the longer he lives he will increase in piety. You will do more good deeds, pray five times a day, give sadqah if Ramadan comes along, you will fast. Allah willing, if you have an opportunity to do Hajj or Umrah and do other good deeds, recite Quran, do dhikr, mashallah, whatever. The longer you live, you will be able to do more. And if you are bad and don't follow deen, as long as you're still alive, you still have an opportunity to repent. And whatever you have done, then if you are given an opportunity to repent and repent, then A person who has repented is like someone who hasn't sinned. But if a person dies in that sinful state, he's lost that opportunity. So the Prophet ﷺ has stated uh, that none of you should wish for death. Especially, you know, many a times when people are inflicted with hardships, ill health, financial problems, troubles, many people feel suicidal. And many people wish they would die. And some people even pray for death. But the Prophet has prohibited that. And the Prophet said, especially don't pray for death, even due to hardship. And Imam Bukhari has reported it in his Sahih. But in the later part of his life, Imam Bukhari himself prayed for death. In his biography, it is stated when Imam Bukhari had differences with the scholars of the time. And one night he prayed, Ya Allah, Allahumma inna hudaqat alayya al-ardu bima rahubat. Ya Allah, the earth in spite of its vastness has become tight upon me. So take me away. And one of his associates says, before the end of the month, Imam Bukhari left this world. So Imam Bukhari knew the hadith, but still prayed. The Prophet wasallam said, if you are going to pray for death, then don't say, Ya Allah, give me death. Rather say, Ya Allah, Allahumma ahyini ma kanat al-hayatu khayran li, wa tawaffani idha kanat al-wafatu khayran li. Ya Allah, keep me alive as long as it is better for me to live, and Ya Allah, if it is better for me to leave this world, then take me away. Sometimes a person is on the good, he's doing good, but because of problems, he can't remain, he finds it difficult to remain on the straight and narrow. So for such a person, might become better to leave sooner than later. 
But for an ordinary person who's on the good, better if he lives longer. And if he's on the wrong path, still at least he has a chance that he might repent. And if he repents before dying, all the better. But if a person dies, he's lost that opportunity. But Imam Bukhari Ramaullah prayed in spite of knowing the hadith. He didn't say, Ya Allah, keep me alive as long as it is better for me to live. And then take me away when it is better for me to die. His prayer as reported in his biography is, Ya Allah, take me away. So Allah has stated because the hadith said due to hardship. And it was general hardship. But Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, he understood it to mean uh, due to hardship of dunya. But this was affecting his deen. Uh, so he prayed to Allah to take him away. So Allah accepted his dua. But he did what apparently contradicts the hadith. So do people say, people are very quick to point fingers at Imam Abu Hanifa, but do they point fingers at Imam Bukhari? Sometimes you read a hadith, and if anybody tried to obey that hadith, or so to do what the hadith says, in fact he will be doing the opposite of what Rasulullah actually wanted. I'll give you another example. From Medina to Munawwara, Mecca is in a southerly direction. If you see the map, Mecca Mukarma is lower down on the map, Medina Munawwara is further up. So Medina is in the north from Mecca, so but from Medina, Mecca is in, in a southerly direction. So this is a hadith reported in Sahih Bukhari as well. The Prophet said, إِذَا أَتَيْتَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْغَائِتَ فَلَا تَسْتَقْبِلُ الْقِبْلَةَ وَلَا تَسْتَدْبِرُوهَا بِبَوْلٍ وَلَا غَائِتٍ When any of you comes to the toilet and you want to urinate or pass stool, then don't face the Qibla and don't turn your back to the Qibla either. Don't face the Qibla and don't turn your back to the Qibla. وَلَكِنْ شَرِّقُوا أَوْ غَرِّبُوا Either face the east or the west. Because from Makkah, from Medina, Qibla is in south. So the Prophet ﷺ was saying, so when you come to the toilet, whether you want to urinate or whether you want to pass stool, don't sit facing the north or the south. Don't sit in this direction, sit either facing that way or facing that way. Yes? Sit across. So this implies to those who were living in Medina, in the northerly direction or in a southerly direction. But those who lived directly east or west, the Prophet said to the people of Medina, that when you come to the toilet, don't face the Qibla or turn your back to it, either face east or face west. So now somebody else who lives in the east or the west, if he picks up Bukhari, he will find the Prophet said, face east or west. So if he faces east or west, what will he be doing? He'll be facing the Qibla. So that is exactly what the Prophet said, don't do. So this hadith will apply to them. This hadith is in Bukhari, but it won't apply to them. So sometimes when you pick up hadith, you really need to know what is the Prophet ﷺ saying. In this particular example, it might be quite clear. But in other examples, it might not be quite clear. So an ordinary person will not be in that situation to make that decision. And who will? The fuqaha will. And so when, when, I've given you five examples. And this is just from the tip of the iceberg. The first one, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu. The Prophet is telling him to do something, and what is he saying? The Prophet is telling him to do it, and he's saying, Wallahi, I won't do it. So if anybody makes a fatwa on Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, of denying, rejecting, doing the opposite of hadith, what will his fatwa be for Hazrat Ali? Then the Prophet said, don't pray except in Banu Qurayza, but Sahaba prayed and the Prophet didn't tell him off. So what is their fatwa for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Then the Prophet said, wear white clothes. But most people don't wear white clothes. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, don't pray for death. But Imam Bukhari prayed for death. Hazrat Umar did the same. Hazrat Ali did the same as well. When Hazrat Umar was returning from his last Hajj, and he stopped at a place, he looked up, Ya Allah, I've grown old. My thoughts have become scattered. 
Ya Allah, take me away before it's too late. He came to Medina, only a few days passed, and Allah gave him martyrdom. So what will the fatwa be for someone Rasulullah trusted and someone Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah has placed the haq on the heart and tongue of Umar, but he is doing what the opposite now, you know, what appears to be the opposite of what Rasulullah stated. And then a classic case of one, where if someone tries to do what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, he will be disobeying Rasulullah and doing the opposite of what actually Rasulullah wanted in the case of going to the toilet. As those who live in the east and the west, the Prophet said, according to Imam Bukhari's narration in his Sahih, the Prophet said, face east or west, and those who live in east and the west, if they face east or west, they will be facing the Qibla, or turning their backs to the Qibla. And so the issue of drawing conclusions, making istimbat, isn't everybody's cup of tea. And this is for the fuqaha. And if an ordinary person makes his decision, even if he happens to be right, he's wrong. But if a mujtahid makes a decision, makes its istimbat, even if he was wrong in his decision, Rasulullah sallallahu will still reward him. Falahu ajr. Wain asaba falahu ajran. If he makes a mistake, Allah will still reward him with one reward, and if he reaches the correct conclusion, Allah will give him a double reward. So if a person following his own research, even if his research happens to be right, on this particular occasion he might be right, but in principle he's wrong. And if a person is following a mujtahid, even though the decision might be wrong, but the principle is right, because you are obeying mujtahid scholars and following uh, the Ulul Amr people of authority, as Allah has commanded in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhin amanu atiullah wa atiur rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. Obey Allah, obey His Messenger, and obey the people of authority. So I started off by saying, ultimate obedience is for Allah, but because Allah doesn't send revelation upon everybody, Allah sends revelation only upon His Nabi and Rasul. So we need to follow the Rasul in order to obey Allah. But the same principle can be extended to us as well. We haven't seen Rasulullah. So we need people to tell us what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa might have said or done. And picking up books of hadith, which are just books of statement, even though a particular narration might be sahih, although in by far some narrations are sahih, some weak, some fabricated, uh, so relying on narrations isn't the solution. And ordinary people are not required to know a hadith in detail. As I gave you an example, if somebody who learned to pray without knowing a single verse of Quran or a single hadith, you all agree, then everybody will agree his prayer will be valid. Uh, so ordinary people uh, in light of Quran need to follow fuqaha. Hadith is important, is to be respected, taught, learned. Uh, but the conclusions from hadith are to be drawn by fuqaha, not by ordinary people. But the problem unfortunately and sadly is, uh, too many muftis min al-muft, freestyle muftis are drawing conclusions when they have no knowledge and grounding and authority to draw conclusions. And people who are following the Qur'an and authentic hadiths as presented by the imams, and they are being clear, Brother, who are you going to follow, Imam Abu Hanifa or the Prophet Wasallam? So next time anybody says to you or asks you this question, you know the guy isn't talking good language, he's talking the language of shaitan and he's lost the plot himself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us and guide us all to the right path.